All right, this video is over probability models. So it's our second video about probability, and this one starts making probability hopefully very easy for you. So let's talk about some probability models. First off, probability is built on an idea that we don't know what will happen, but we can think about what could happen. Anything that is called a chance process means that the, what the outcome is purely chance. So let's do the one thing that we actually are pretty good at right now in this class, and that's modeling. So why are we good at modeling? Well, first, we have used density curves to represent data. We've used least squares regressions lines to model relationships between variables. So it's only fitting that we're going to use a probability model to model probability. So that's the whole idea, is modeling. Okay, so what the heck is a probability model? A probability model is very easy to do. It only involves two steps. First, make a list of all possible outcomes. We call this our sample space. The sample space is literally nothing more than a list of everything that could happen in your chance process. And the second thing you need is the probability for each one of those outcomes. So let's make a couple probability models for two really, really easy examples. First, tossing a coin. When I toss a coin, there are two outcomes. And we'll use a capital X here to represent the possible outcomes. So when you toss a coin, the possible outcomes are a head or a tail. And then next to that, we're going to put the probabilities of those. And we use a probability of capital X equals little x. Now, just so you understand what that notation is, is that x is the chance um, random event tossing a coin. There are two outcomes, little x head, little x tail. So we're trying to find the probability that those little x's, again, that's the individual outcomes from this chance process of flipping a coin. And we, everybody knows that the probability of getting a head is one half. You may also write 0.5. You may also write 50%. I don't care. And the chance of getting a tail is also one half or 0.5 or 50 percent. So very, very easy there. Makes a whole lot of sense. That is a probability model. We list all of our outcomes and the, pro and the probability of each. Let's talk about rolling a die. Rolling a die is a chance variable, a chance outcome, and we could get a 1, we could get a 2, we could get a 3, we could get a 4, we could get a 5, or we could get a 6. And next to all of those numbers, we're going to write the probability of each one of those individual events. And um, the probability of rolling a 1, well, there's one side, that is a 1 out of 6, that would be 1 sixth. Now, 1 sixth is 16.6666666% or 0.16. So this is the case where I do not want to just write 0.16 or even 0.17 or even 0.1666 because none of those are exactly correct. The only exact answer would be 1/6. So keep that in mind. Okay, the chance of rolling a 2 is also 1/6. Chance of rolling a 3 is 1/6. A uh, 4 is 1/6. A uh, 5 is 1/6 and a I almost wrote one fit there. And a 6 is 1/6 as well. So each one of these outcomes is one-sixth. So that is another probability model. Very easy. Now these are two probability models where the probabilities are equally. So they're equally likely, right? The, the chance of getting a one is equally as likely as any other number. Let's look at an example where that might not necessarily be true. And we could do that by looking at an example of rolling two die. So some kids get a little bit confused when we roll two die, so I want to make sure I have this picture here explaining to you what happens when you roll two die. And here is all of the options. There are 36 total options. Um, if you think about six options for the first die times six options for the second die, you can understand where we get 36 options from, and here they all are. Now, we want to look at the sum of the two die. The sum of the two die is a chance outcome. It could be one of several options. So we're going to use a capital X here for the sum. Now, um, the sum could never be one. We're never going to have a sum of one because that would imply that one of the die was a zero, and that's impossible. So the smallest sum we could have is two. We could have a sum of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, or we could even have a sum of 12. We cannot have anything bigger than 12 because the biggest sum for each die is a 6 and a 6. So let's find the probability of each of these events. Okay, the probability of rolling a 2. The only way to roll a 2 is right there, a 1 and a 1, snake eyes we call it. So there's 1 out of a 36 chance that you roll a sum of 2. 
a sum of three. Well, if I look at this chart, there are two ways that I can rule a sum of three. A one and then a two, or a two and then a one. Either of those end up with a sum of three. So that would be two out of 36, which could be reduced to one out of 18. Uh, the sum of a four, if I look here, this is perfect. I could have a one, three, a two, two, or a three, one. And again, looking at this chart makes it very easy to see all the outcomes. So there are three out of 36 ways that you could get to a sum of four, which would reduce to one twelfth. How about a sum of five? Well, here they are right here in this nice diagonal. Th uh, one, four, two, three, three, two, or four, one. So there are four ways to get a sum of five. So four out of 36. Um, that would reduce to one ninth. And how about a six? Well, you could have one, five, two, four, three, three, uh, four, two, or five, one. So there are one, two, three, four, five different ways that you can get a sum of six. So five out of 36. And 5 out of 36 can't be reduced. And how about a 7? So we could have 1, 6, 2, 5, 3, 4, 4, 3, 5, 2, 6, 1. So there are 7 ways. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I take that back, sorry. 6 ways to get a sum of 7. So 6 out of 36. And my writing's getting a little bit messy here, so it's kind of falling in line. So maybe make some lines like this to make it very clear as to what is what here. So sorry about my sloppiness. Okay, how about a sum of eights? Well, we can continue on here. I won't bore you too much, but obviously you can see them in the chart. So one, two, three, four, five ways to get a sum of eights. So that's five out of 36. Sum of nine. One, two, three, four ways to get a sum of nine. So we noticed that we kind of climbed up the ladder, and now we're climbing back down. And then we got, uh, four, th 36 is one ninth, of course. Uh, Ten it would be three out of 36 which is 1 12th. 11 would be 2 out of 36, or 1 18th. And lastly, to get a 12, there's only one way to get a 12, a 6 and a 6, and that would be 1 out of 36. So again, we start to see the different ways that we can get a sum here. Sorry for my sloppiness on that probability model. But again, I listed every possible outcome for ruling two die and the sum I could get, and I listed their probabilities. So that is um, probability models. This is obviously not equally likely. You are more likely to get a 7, which is 1 6. The 7 is the most likely outcome, where a 2 and a 12 are the next lowest um, in terms of likelihood. Now, let's move on and talk about events. Events are any collection of outcomes. Okay, so now that we understand that in a chance process we have a whole bunch of outcomes, an event is any collection of outcomes, meaning kind of grouping them together. For example, if I said, what's the probability, again, let's think about rolling two die and looking at the sum, about the sum is even. Well, now I'm talking about the sum being even. That means the sum could be two, the sum could be four, the sum could be six, or the sum could be eight, uh, 10 or 12. So we're looking at a collection of values. So we'd come back to our chart and we would look at the options that are even, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and we would add them together to get that probability. So sorry. So when we come back here, to get a 2, there's one way. To get a 4, there are three ways. To get a 6, there are five ways. To get an 8, there are five ways. To get a 10, there is three ways. To get a 12, there's one way. So if we add these together, we get 1 and 3 is 4, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So there's 18 out of 36 ways to get a sum that is even. Uh, so 18 out of 36, which reduced to 1 half. So that's an event. Sum is even. It's a collection of several things. Sum is prime, right? Okay, let's talk about prime numbers. Um, 2 is a prime number. 3 is a prime number. Uh, 4 is not. 5 is not. 6 is not. 7 is a prime number. 8 is not. 9 is not. 10 is not. 11 is a prime number. Um, 12 is not. So again, we would just add up those options for the sum being prime. Again, it's an event. It's a collection of outcomes. The sum is greater than 4. Be careful. Greater than 4 means uh, strictly 5 or 6. So how many outcomes are 5 or 6? Um, I'm sorry, or on up, obviously, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So it would be anything above 4. Uh, rolling a double is another one because you can get a 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6. That's a little bit easier to see. So there's 6 out of 36 ways to get a double. So this, the idea is that an event is a collection of outcomes, not simply just one outcome. 
All right, so next let's talk about a pretty important vocabulary word. Definitely want to make sure you write this down and understand this. This is a pretty important vocabulary word for the rest of the unit. Mutually exclusive. Another way of saying mutually exclusive is disjoint. However, we prefer to use the phrase mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive are two events, A and B, are mutually exclusive if they have no outcomes in common, meaning that the probability of A and B occurring at the same time is zero. They can never occur together. I mean, there's several different ways I can say this. They have no outcomes in common. They could never occur together. The probability of them both happening at the same time is a big fat zero. Here's some examples, right? Over here, we have examples that are mutually exclusive. These are disjoint. Head and tail. There's no way you're ever going to get a head and a tail the same time. They can never occur at the same time. The probability that you get a head and a tail at the same time is zero. Um, rolling two die, rolling a sum of seven and a sum of nine. Well, you can't be a sum of seven and a sum of nine at the same time. There's no way that those both sums are going to happen on the same roll. That's impossible. The probability is zero. Uh, sum even and sum odd. You, there's no way you can ever roll a sum and it be even and odd at the exact same time. They cannot occur together. Okay. Uh, last one we could talk about with cards. If you have, if you're familiar with cards, this should make sense. Um, the probability of you getting a heart and a spade at the same time is impossible. There is no one card that is both a heart and a spade at the same time. So mutually exclusive are two events that cannot occur together at the same time. Not mutually exclusive. So let, let's make sure we understand some examples that are not mutually exclusive. So you could get a sum of a sum that's even and a multiple of three. This would work because, for example, 6 or 9 or 12, I'm sorry, not 9, 6 or 12, these are sums that are even and also multiples of 3. So these two um, could occur at the same time. So these are not mutually exclusive. Sum prime and a sum is 5. Prime, we already talked about, is 2, 5, 7, um, 3, I skipped over 3, not 9, not 6, uh, not 8, uh, 11. So these are our prime sums. Well, 5 is one of them, so this could happen at the same time. You could end up with both of these at the same time. Um, when you're dealing with cards, here's another one, king and face card. There is one card, or actually, I take that back, there are four cards that are kings and also face cards. So these two things could happen at the same time. There are four kings, the king of hearts, the king of spades, the king of diamonds, the king of clubs, and there are plenty of face cards when you think about queens, jacks, and kings, and some people even call aces face cards. But they can happen at the same time. If you get a king of hearts, you are both a king and a face card at the same time. That is possible. That's not mutually exclusive. One more example I made up is... Um, some people own a cat, some people own a dog, but some people own both a cat and a dog at the exact same time. So this is the idea of owning a cat, owning a dog are two events, and they certainly have some um, connection. Some people do own both cats and dogs. So mutually exclusive is they cannot occur at the same time. They have no outcomes in common. Now, another way to understand mutually exclusive is what's called a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram is a pictorial way to visualize two events. So, the example on the left here, this is a Venn diagram. It uses circles to represent events. We have event A and event B, and there's overlap here in the middle. This overlap here in the middle is the times where A and B occur at the same time. So, this is not mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive is over here on the right, where they are two events not connected. There's no overlap whatsoever. And this is why they also have the phrase disjoint. And it makes a lot of sense when you see two circles that are not joined together. So that is why disjoint is another way of saying mutually exclusive. Let's really make sure we understand Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams are a big part of probability, and they really help us understand probability. So if we look at these two events, A and B, in between here, this is the probability of A and B, right? In the middle there is A and B happening at the same time. Now this entire red circle is A. Everything in this red circle is A. So the part over here would be only A not B. So this is a very specific part on the far left-hand side here, only A and not B. Same thing, the entire green circle is B, so the part over here on the far right would be only B, 
not A. So those are very, very specific probabilities. So the entire circle that's red would be A, which includes some only A, and then some A and B. And the green is all B, which, of course, has two parts, part that is only B and part that is A and B. The white part is also important to understand. The white part is not A and not B, right? That's the outside part. That is neither of them. So there are four important parts when you look at one of these Venn diagrams. You have the, the connected part on the inside, that's A and B. You have this very specific part right here that is A, not B. Over here, B, not A. And then don't forget about the part on the outside that is neither A nor B. It's, 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 it's neither part. So um, and Venn diagrams are really important. We're going to talk about them a lot in class. So if you have overlap, if you are not mutually exclusive, you will have this overlap right here because that means that they can occur at the same time. Let me give you one quick example with this. If we're talking about cards, right, and we're talking about A as being spades and B as being a king, right? Right smack dab in the middle here is that one card that's the king of spades. That is one card that is both a king and a spade at the same time. Over here, this would be like the king of hearts, the king of diamonds, and the king of um, clubs, right? Because these cards are kings, but they're not spades. Over here, this would be all the other spades. So all other spades. So we're talking the two of spades, the three of spades, the four of spades, the ten of spades, the ace of spades, all the other spades. And then this part inside of here would be the king of spades. But the one card that is both of those, that's the overlap. So hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. The part out here would be cards that are nothing, blank cards, like a joker, right? A joker's not a spade, a joker's not a king. Um, what else would be out here? Uh, the two of hearts would be out here. That would be a card that is um, not a spade, and it's certainly not a king. So that would be everything else would be on the outside. All right, so enough of that. Let's do one more example of a probability model, and we'll be done with this video. So for a fundraiser, anyone could spin a giant spinner to try to win for a cost of $10, meaning a ten, it costs you $10 to spin this wheel. If you land on yellow, you win $100, red, you win $0, blue, you win $5, and green, you win $6. Make a probability model for your net winnings. Well, the first thing we've got to consider is what could happen when we spin this, right? And we've got to understand that this is net winnings. That's pretty important. So, first thing I could do is I could land on yellow. If I land on yellow, I win $100, but remember, it costs me 10 So, my net winning would be $90 if I land in yellow. All right, if I land in green... If I land in green, I win $6. Well, remember, it cost me $10 to play, so I'm technically down $4. So I've lost $4 because it cost me $10 to play. That's green. If I land in red, well, red says that I win zero. So if I land in red, I've lost $10. Okay, and that's obviously not a good thing. And lastly is blue. If I land in blue, it says I win $5. Well, if I win $5, that is a, whoop, I meant to change to blue there, sorry. If I land in $5, that is a loss of $5 because it cost me $10 to play. So now you can understand why this is a fundraiser because most situations end with you losing money. So that is why the um, your profits could be either $90, negative 4, negative 10, or negative 5. So now we need to figure out the probability of these events. And what's the probability that I win $90? Well, to win $90, I must land in that one yellow spot. Well, if you go ahead and count these up, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, there's 12 spots. Only one of them is yellow, so there's a 1 12th chance that you get that $90. How about the negative 4? That's the green. There are 3 out of 12 that are green. That would reduce to 1 4th or you could say 0.25 for that. The red, there are 5 out of 12 that are red, so there's my 5 twelfths. And lastly, there are 3 out of 12 that are blue, and that would also reduce to 1 fourth. So that's my probability model for my net winnings, and hopefully you understand why it's a fundraiser, because only 1 twelfth of the time am I going to win that $90. All the other cases cost me to lose money, so a lot of my money is going to go to the fundraiser. But make sure that you understand the idea of the net winnings there, and how I figured out what could happen based on where I land, and then I start matching up the associated probabilities. All right, that's it for probability models. Hopefully it was nice and sweet and everybody understands it. Just please make sure you truly understand mutually exclusive. That is a big topic in this class.